Greetings to you all, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. George Xavier Koza, and I'll be doing some recordings for you for the clock exams, both clock two and clock one. This is basically a Ukrainian exam, national board exam, that is done once medical students are done completing their medical education. So for this videos what i'm basically going to be doing is giving you some points and hints on how you can approach these questions so most of these ideas are obviously from my experience because i i did clock and i believe i performed well enough to be to be making such recordings so i hope uh you guys would uh, be able to use the same skills I, I did and if you guys have any suggestions on any other videos I can potentially make for you guys in request please feel free to put your suggestions and additions in the comment section anyway so without further ado we'll start with our first questions so for each question of course uh, according to the scheme that I have the correct answer is a but in my tutorials my point is not for you to just get the correct answer so my point uh, is for you to try get an, an understanding first of all of of the question and the approach you can use to answering these questions so anyway we'll get started with the first question um, all right so we have number one a 32 year old uh, Walter complains of weakness and fever his illness initially presented as tonsillitis one month earlier. On examination, he has a body temperature of 38.9 degrees Celsius. His respiratory rate is 24. His heart rate is 100 beats per minute. And his blood pressure is 100, 100 over 70. So he has, hemorrhage, he has hemorrhages on his legs and enlargement of the lymph nodes. And then uh, the complete CBC uh, informs you that the hemoglobin is 70. Uh, grams per liter and the, the red blood cell count is 2.2 while the WBC is 3 and the presence of blood cells and the xenophil count is 1% and the band neutrophils are 3% and the segmented neutrophils are 36% um, his lymphocytes are 20 and the monocytes are 8% his ESR is 20 47 millimeters per hour uh, the question is what is the cause of the anemia all right so usually uh, the way I approach uh, multiple choice questions in general is first of all I will start off by reading the, the last statement of the question for instance I'll start off by reading what is the cause of the anemia so of course for the first question it would have been a little bit awkward for me to just start off by reading the question because that would make sense but um, the way I approach it, I first of all read the question. So what is the cause of this anemia? So that gives me an idea of what I'm potentially dealing with and um, what I need to look out for. So when I'm reading the stems, I need to be looking out for signs of anemia because there are different causes of anemia in general. All right. Um, all right. Let me get my pencil too. All right. So the first thing... So the first thing I need you guys to, to be aware of is when you're answering these questions, please, you should make sure you're aware of the age of the patient every time. The age will give you uh, an idea of what you're dealing with because that uh, helps understand the epidemiology of various diseases because some diseases occur in, in adulthood, some prefer to occur in, in infantry and, and some in senile patients. So... The question being is, what is the main cause of the anemia? So we have a 32-year-old man, right? And also remember that occupation, in some cases, is important because we have occupational diseases. His main complaints are weakness and fever, correct? Um, also, there are various causes of fever, and he had an infection of tonsillitis, which occurred one month earlier. So tonsillitis for one month, and uh, already he's feverish. Right, which is also present in the objective findings, which is the sign that is present. He has tachypnea, and to some extent, if we're using Ukrainian recommendations, this would, would be recognized as tachycardia because in Ukraine they, they believe tachycardia, um, a normal uh, 
pulse rate should be from 60 to 90 uh, beats per minute. So 100 would be towards the upper limit. And then as, as blood pressure is to some extent a little bit lower than usual, so on the level 70. And then he's presenting with hemorrhages on his legs. So a presentation of hemorrhages uh, on a patient's legs, which are spontaneous, in this case would assume that it's spontaneous, uh, would probably be due to something as uh, um, a shortage of platelets or a decreased amount of platelets. Um, and then he has enlarged lymph nodes. So lymph node enlargement can be due to various causes, infection, it can be due to um, tumors, for example, um, maybe a lymphoma or a leukemia in this case can be a cause of, of, a, of the enlargement of the lymph nodes. And then um, low hemoglobin to signify the pneumonia and low RBC. The WBC count is low as well, three. So the normal WBC that we can usually expect in, in adults is between <coughs> uh, 4 to 11 and then if we're looking at um, CBC uh, we usually expect a CBC of uh, 4 to 6 in general so it's just an average number and then the presence of blast cells so blast cells are usually significant or would help you understand that uh, you have um, acute leukemia you have an acute leukemia. It doesn't really specify uh, what exactly what type of leukemia you might potentially have, but what I always remembered, especially for these clock questions, guys, blast cells if they're present, present in large numbers, because we expect it uh, at least uh, less than five percent. Uh, if they if they're more than that, or if they're an excessive number, thirty two percent is really a large number. I can definitely start thinking of an acute leukemia straight away. Uh, and as well, if I start to think of an acute leukemia, it is everything else starts to make sense, eh? Um, all right. And then we have uh, uh, a sinophil count of, of one, uh, band neutrophils of, of three, uh, which uh, to some extent are a bit reduced, and 36% of segmented um, neutrophils. But the lymphocytic count is, is normal. All right, so when you're looking at a leukemia, so we have two types. So you're looking at acute leukemias, we can have either a myeloid leukemia or a lymphocytic uh, leukemia. So in this case already, you can tell that uh, it won't be a lymphocytic leukemia. It's unlikely that it will be a lymphocytic leukemia as the lymphocytic count is normal. Um, and then we have a uh, monocytes of 8% and an ESR of 47. Um, all right. So from the answers, of course, the answer is acute leukemia. Again, the reason for saying so is that we have a high amount of blood cells, that's one, and also we have a low WBC, and then, of course, the anemia is accompanying the leukemia. So in leukemia, what you have is basically a tumor. It's a tumor of white blood cells, uh, which results in um, uh, production, excessive production of immature cells, which are going to be released in the blood cells, and which are going to weaken the immune system. So as a result, the patient will start having uh, symptoms as um, various infections, which can be tonsillitis in this case, uh, although the patient is really a bit fe feverish in this case. Um, all right, so, so that's to do with the first question. Um, all right, so moving on. Um, all right, so... Moving on, number two. Um, the question is make the diagnosis. So I understand that I need to make a diagnosis uh, of a psychotic disorder because they, these are psychotic conditions. All right, so after, after, after a long day, five day, after a five day long celebration of his daughter's wedding, a 65 year old patient, so it's a geriatric patient we're dealing with, saw in his yard many cats, chickens, and rats. Saw in his yard. So also saw in codes tells you something is, is up in this case. He tried to chase them away, but was scared off when the animals started to scold him and try to harm him. Uh, so he tried to chase them away, and he was scared when the animals started to scold him. Uh, and the farmer, meaning that the animals are basically speaking to him 
uh, which would be um, a little bit odd. So in this case, um, we can start to think of delirium and tremens. Why are we thinking of delirium and tremens? Because we have a patient, right, who went to the festive celebration, which was happening for five days, all right. So after a five day long celebration, so it's quite uh, a long celebration. So you can, you can assume in this case as well that uh, there were some um, alcoholic beverages in this case. Uh, and then um, the patient was drinking for a long time. And then the patient went on a break. So usually what happens with delirium, delirium treatments is that uh, the patient would have stopped drinking for at least, uh, it's an alcohol withdrawal syndrome. That means the patient has stopped drinking within the last 72 hours and then they start to experience hallucinations as well as some other neurological symptoms as well. Um, so the hallucinations obviously I explained by the fact that uh, I started to see cats, chickens and rats and shockingly these animals were, started, were, were talking to them which uh, can clearly help you understand that uh, these are visual hallucinations uh, which are quite common in delirium treatments. All right, um, so as I mentioned, delirium treatment is characterized by altered mental status uh, as well as a sympathetic overdrive, which can eventually progress to a cardiovascular collapse. All right, so just to go over some of the other options that we have. So for example, senile psychosis uh, is a gradual onset psychosis which usually occurs over time and is seen in relatively old people and old patients um, and symptoms don't present acutely as as we saw in this patient and then um, when you have um, <clears throat> uh, schizophrenia uh, basically uh, patients usually start to present symptoms earlier on in life yes they have they may have hallucinations in schizophrenia but um, it's not something you might expect to see like in a patient who has 65 percent for the first time maybe early on like in the 20s or 30s something like that that's when you can start to think of schizophrenia but yes in terms of symptomatology it is characterized by the presence of visual as well as auditory hallucinations uh, and then looking at um, reactive uh, psychosis or hallucinosis it's a um, it's a brief uh, psychotic disorder that is uh, characterized or marked with stress um, <clears throat> uh, following a, a very, very stressful event such as um, one's loved one passing away, for example. Usually occurs after a very, very stressful event. In this case, we cannot uh, start to think of a stressful event because this patient was celebrating for the past five days. Uh, so in my mind, I wouldn't start to think of a of a celebratory event. Uh, and then finally, we have organic uh, brain syndrome, which is a mental disorder whereby um, the, the organic uh, function of the brain is, is poor and is, is, not, is not at its best. <clears throat> and it usually occurs uh, due to other organic disorders, such as a trauma or brain infections or metabolic dysfunction or endocrine or nutritional deficiencies. Uh, those are the instances where we can see organic brain syndrome. Um, so these terms also as well are, are, are I'll say more common when you use, when you see Ukrainian exams. So anyway, the answer in this case simple and straightforward is delirium tremens. All right. So moving on to number three. Um, so the question says, what heart disorders? Um, does, what heart disorder such clinical representation is character, characteristic of? All right, so answer being non-romantic myocarditis. All right, so let's go over the question together. All right, so we have an eight-year-old boy, all right, who has a temperature of 87.5 for two days. So this patient is already sub-febrile. So it's not uh, exactly that. It's very, but it's sub-febrile. Uh, and, and he's recovering from an upper respiratory tract infection. So maybe he's recovering from a flu uh, or cold. Uh, and then he comes complaining of suffocation, so basically difficulty in breathing, I would term that maybe dys dyspnea. Uh, and he's also having some heart pain, uh, which might be angina in this case. And objectively, the patient is looking pale. Uh, maybe the patient is having anemia or my 
my analogy, uh, patient has tachycardia, uh, the first heart sound is weakened, right, and the short systolic murmur, uh, and the fourth intercostal space uh, near the left edge of the breast bone. Right, so in this case, uh, what we basically have is uh, non rheumatic fever because the patient uh, is uh, first of all recovering from an upper respiratory tract infection and then is presenting with um, cardiovascular symptoms, which would something, uh, which is something, sorry, that would be, would be expecting in, in myocarditis. So Although myocarditis is difficult to diagnose in practice, but in most cases it all usually occurs as a result of uh, infections and in, in, uh, viral infections and in patients that are recovering. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and uh, usually it can be seen, for example, in, um, in patients that are traveling, uh, that would have traveled for, to some other country and have acquired uh, a viral infection. That's where you can see it, for example. And then in terms of diagnosis, diagnosis uh, it's based on the first occurrence uh, of an infection uh, as, as opposed to rheumatic carditis, which appears uh, two to three weeks after infection. So we wouldn't call this rheumatic um, carditis because usually in rheumatic carditis, you might have, yes, an upper respiratory tract infection such as tonsillitis, right? Uh, but uh, it would usually appear two to, to three weeks because you'd need uh, antibodies to first of all develop against the M protein, which uh, uh, which the immune system will be will be attacking the cross mimicking that is occurring between the, the M protein of the streptococcus antigen and the cardiac myocytes or cardiac cells. Um, that's where the confusion is in the immune system. So that usually takes time for that to, to develop. That's why uh, it's going to take about two to three weeks for the infection to develop. But usually symptomatology is, is, is a bit similar. All right, so so moving on to, <coughs> uh, to the other questions. So we have question number four now. All right, so what is the most likely diagnosis? What is the most likely diagnosis? All right, so we have a 28 year old woman. So this lady is 28. All right, All right. 28 year old woman. All right, uh, who has delivered, who has been delivered to a hospital with acute pain in the lower abdomen. All right, so acute pain in the lower abdomen. She had a brief episode of syncope. Uh, so probably she was hypertensive, then she had the C copy, uh, then she has a delay of menses by two months. So usually in women, when they have had a delay of menses, especially for this period of two months, we can start to think of pregnancy. Uh, <clears throat> on, on physical examination, this patient is pale, uh, probably she is also anemic to some extent, and she has a BP of 90 to 50, this is definitely hypotensive uh, she has a pulse of 110 which is tachycardia and then the lower abdomen um, it's extremely painful the lower abdomen is extremely painful so vaginal examination reviews uterus enlargement so vaginal examination reviews uterus enlargement which uh, would be a line with all would be in sync with her being potentially pregnant right potentially she could she should be pregnant and then prompt of sign, uh, which is uh, pain during bimanual examination is positive. All right, so pain during bimanual examination is positive. Then the right uterine appendages are enlarged and very painful. And then the posterior fold hangs over. All right, and uh, the correct answer in this case is a right-sided tuber pregnancy. All right, so the reason why um, this patient is said to have a right-sided tubal pregnancy is because, um, as I mentioned earlier, this patient has had a delay of menses for two months, which would, first of all, make us suspect pregnancy, right? And then she has lower 
<coughs> sorry she has lower uh, she has low abdominal pain uh, and then right uterine appendages which are enlarged uh, which would help us think or align with the idea of it being a tubal pregnancy and then her being hypotensive um, is also explained by the fact that she's pregnant so using these uh, many these signs is, is what would help me answer the question as why is right-sided tubal pregnancy uh, so if we're thinking of apoplexy, right, apoplexy would occur if there's a sudden rupture of ovaries, um, usually commonly seen at, at a cyst or an oval cyst, and usually that is accompanied by um, excessive hemorrhaging, excessive bleeding, as well as intraperitoneal bleeding. Now, pain in this case would primarily occur mid-cycle after or after a minor delay in in menstruation so minor delay being like less than a week or something so in this case we had a long duration in terms of delay it was about two months delay so we can start to definitely think of pregnancy rather than thinking of ovarian or right ovarian publicity right and of course in terms of characterization of the pain it's also going to be localized in the lower abdomen all right and then the pain in this case for ovarian apoplexy can potentially uh, radiate to the rectum or to the umbilical or to the lumbar area so that's what we see with apoplexy and then if you're looking at um, acute uh, right-sided salpingo ophoritis uh, <clears throat> the characteristic of the pain uh, would be the same in that the pain will be in the lower abdomen and the pelvis uh, but uh, in this case uh, the menstrual cycle would be present and the menstrual, uh, the menstruation bleeding would be heavier than usual or it would uh, have bleeding occurring in between the cycle and then also you'd potentially find pain during intercourse with a heavy vaginal discharge which sometimes has a foul smelling disorder. Um, uh, in, in certain cases, you might as well find a uh, burning sensation or pain during urination or difficulty in urination altogether. Um, all right, so all right, so in this case, uh, I think uh, we can move on to to the next next question that we have, which is question number five. <clears throat> all right, so. For question number five, what investigation is required for diagnosis verification? All right, uh, what is required for diagnosis verification? All right, so we have uh, a patient uh, which has five weeks. So five weeks after hypothermia at 22, okay, five weeks after having an episode of hypothermia, 22 year old patient, so 22 year old patient developed the following symptoms fever, weakness, and muscle pain, as well as inability to move independently. All right, so objectively, on physical exam, there was tenderness in duration of the shoulders and the shin muscles and restrictive restricted active movements as well as erythema on the anterior surface of the chest um, <clears throat> uh, there is also periorbital edema heliotropic erythema and gotran sign and gotran sign so the question is what investigation is required for you to make the diagnosis for verification so before you think of the investigation, first of all, you have to think of what is the potential diagnosis in this case. Uh, in this case, what we are dealing with is dermatomyositis, uh, which uh, is a rare inflammatory disorder. The reason why uh, we're thinking of uh, dermatomyositis is that, um, first of all, derma, meaning skin, and myo, meaning muscle, and situs is basically, uh, or itis is basically inflammation, right? So you have tenderness and induration of shoulder shin muscles. So the muscles are not um, working as far as they should. And you also have erythema um, of the anterior chest. 
uh, <clears throat> as well as Gortrum's sign, which is an heliotrop an heliotropic erythema, which are dermatological findings that you'd find in a pathology. All right. So basically, when you when you have this disease, um, the the main uh, diagnostic tool is a myo muscle biopsy because the muscle biopsy will give you a sample of the tissues and you can be able to visualize um, the tissue histologically uh, <clears throat> and using a microscope as well. So so basically that's what uh, you'd be using in this case. Uh, then the other other tests and samples that are here are not very much specific for dermatomyositis. For example, AS or titer. Uh, would be used if you're thinking of uh, streptococci and uh, if you think of st streptococci infection or you're thinking of um, uh, post strept glomerulonephritis uh, and then uh, rheumatoid factor will be used of course when you're thinking of uh, rheumatic, uh, rheumatic, rheumatic disease or rheumatic fever and other uh, rheumatological disorders which might have a positive uh, <coughs> Rheumatoid factor. Um, all right. So moving on to the sixth question. Um, question number six. All right. So what changes of the cerebrospinal fluid are most likely? What changes of the cerebrospinal fluid are most likely? All right. So what do we have here on number six? We have a eighty-seven year old woman. Right, who complains of a headache, nausea, vomiting, and muscle spasms. So the onset of the disease occurred a day before due to overexposure of cold. So she was also hypothermic, like our previous patient. Um, her fever is 40%, so the temperature is quite elevated. Somnolence, uh, which is um, a decreased level of consciousness. And then uh, she has a rigid neck uh, or, or rigidity of the neck. Kernig symptom is positive on both sides. Uh, and then general hyperesthesia, so increased uh, sensitivity. Her blood tests are showing the following a leukocytosis and an increased erythrocyte limitation rate. And then a cerebrospinal fluid um, is showing you. Um, Fluid that is turbid, yellow, and tinted. Um, so, before we start to think of other cerebrospinal fluid changes that you can find, first of all, we have to think of um, what sort of diagnosis this is, or what disease are we dealing with. So, in this case, we are dealing with meningitis we're dealing with meningitis why are we or why am i saying that we're dealing with meningitis is that the patient is having a headache headaches which are quite quite common with uh, meningitis accompanied uh, nausea and vomiting which are non-specific uh, non-specific symptoms right uh, but uh, she also has uh, a positive uh, uh, kerning sign on both sides one and neck rigidity uh, those uh, Three symptoms, mainly headache, a uh, positive uh, kernic sign, and the neck rigidity, uh, are what link me towards or what make me think that is meningitis. And the presence of uh, elevated uh, leukocytosis and ESR means that uh, there's an inflammatory condition which is occurring, which uh, would be in line with uh, <clears throat> meningitis. So in this case, um, because the cerebrospinal fluid is uh, turbid and yellow tinted, um, I would be thinking of uh, bacterial, bacterial uh, meningitis as the etiology. So that is why I would first of all think of the answer to be uh, a neutrophilic pleocytosis, which basically means that there's an increased number of um, neutrophils inside the cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, neutrophils would be increased because these are the main cells uh, in the white blood cells uh, in our innate immune system that first of all would be attacking uh, the bacterial cells. Uh, 
So in the case of uh, lymphocytic pleocytosis, this is what we would see in viral meningitis. Uh, so, for example, if you have uh, meningitis due to herpes or, or herpes uh, zoster virus or, or varicella or it can be cytomegalovirus as well or in other, in the other viral causes. So, that's where you can see a lymphocytic uh, pleocytosis. Uh, this usually presents with a white clear CSF, which is not present in this, in this patient, of course. And then... Uh, if the color of the CSF was red, then you can think of bleeding. Uh, and then yellow, uh, yellow, uh, yellow and tinted is usually uh, bacteria, as I mentioned. And then cloudy for me, uh, CSF is usually uh, associated with, with TB. Uh, xanthocomia is also associated with bleeding, and it's mainly seen in a patient who has. Uh, a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, <clears throat> um, all right. So moving on with the next question. So now we're on question seven. All right. So what conclusion can be made? All right. So we have um, what do we have? We have a forty-four year old patient. Forty-four year old patient is complaining of difficulty in urination. So the patient has difficult urination, right? Um, sensation of incomplete urinary uh, bladder emptying, so incomplete urinary bladder emptying, uh, and then uh, on sonographic examination of urinary bladder the, uh, near the near the urethra entrance, uh, it shows us there's an oval, well defined, so near the bladder entrance is an oval, well defined hyperecogenic formation of two by three centimeters large um, uh, which is uh, changing its position during examination so <clears throat> so in this case the patient uh, is, is clearly presenting uh, with, with classic signs uh, of, a, of a stone that is present in the urinary tract why because first of all they have the difficulty in urine that's one, uh, and a feeling of um, uh, incomplete uh, urination that is occurring, and also the size of the hyperechogenic information. So usually uh, stones uh, are going to be hyperechogenic on ultrasound, um, and they're not going to be that big. So 2 by 3 is not uh, too much of an enlargement, and usually because they'll be going down the urinary tract, you might find them um, uh, near uh, the, the, urine, the opening or the entrance of the urethra. Occasionally, that's where you might find them. So that is why uh, <coughs> the, 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 di the diagnosis or the final conclusion is related to the stones. Now, just to talk a bit about uh, different... Um, types of, of imaging results that you can see it, uh, to, for you guys to understand this between hyperechogenic and, and hypoechogenic. So usually a hypo hypoechoic mass is is more is more solid um, and less echogenic meaning it absorbs more ultrasound waves uh, and appears gray or darker than the surrounding tissue. And it's usually made up of muscle or fibrous connective tissue. And then if you're looking at um, a hyperechoic mass, such as in this case as a stone, um, it's going to be less dense, more, more epigenic, uh, because it's able to reflect ultrasound waves and appears lighter or brighter than the surrounding tissue. Uh, in this case, uh, it can be air, fat, fluid, or the stone, as we have in this case. So if you're thinking of um, of a malignant tumor of the, the urinary blood, of course, uh, first of all, it will be it will be larger than so it will be larger than two by three. Uh, although an ultrasound, it might be uh, hyperechogenic, and the symptoms it would have added symptoms such as um, possibly uh, weight loss that would have been occurring uh, for a long time. 
as well as weakness uh, that will be seen at the patient and um, and the duration as well. So usually, uh, so in this case, there's no time frame, of course, but usually for uh, a tumor, a malignant tumor to develop, uh, <coughs> uh, it would have um, it would have a timeline maybe of, of, of five years or, or more uh, for it to be developed. Same applies to the rest of the tumors that are given in this question. All right. <coughs> So question number eight. Um, so question number eight needs us to understand what infection has developed in the wound. Or what, what infection has developed in the wound. All right. So <clears throat> uh, so for four days. Um, so four days after a patient received uh, a gunshot wound on the soft tissues. So gunshot wound in the soft tissues of the middle third of the thigh. So middle third of the thigh. Uh, his condition uh, began to deteriorate faster than usual. Um, so there are complaints of um, bursting pain in the wound. So this wound is excessively painful for the patient. And the pain has been increasing for the last 12 hours. So the past 12 hours, the pain has been increased. Okay. So we have edema of the skin, so the patient's skin is swollen, and then there's um, hypodemic tissue, um, which quickly uh, grows. And then the uh, patient's body temperature is elevated, all right, so the patient has a fever, heart rate is increased, the patient has a tachycardia, and then uh, wound ages gape, all right, and the down color, uh, the muscles, viable as of before and now protrude into the wound um, so muscles um, muscles viable as day before and now protrude into the wound okay so there have been some some muscular changes that are here so we have some muscular changes in the prison now they look boiled they look bold or dull in color and have a dirty gray coating and fall apart when held, when held by the forces. All right. So, what infection are we dealing with in this case? Uh, all right. So, in this case, we're dealing with an anaerobic infection. All right. So, the reason um, for saying that um, the patient has anaerobic infection is. Uh, First of all, because of the presentation um, of the objective findings that I'll say, these uh, are what would help me understand or, or think more of a, of a, a anaerobic infection because um, the patient's condition was okay, right, for the previous four days. So after 12 hours, it started getting worse. And then um, the texture and the the muscles themselves were not too good. They they were looking dull in terms of color and had a dry coating and a falling apart went out by forceps. Um, and anaerobic infections are usually common in wounds, um, especially gunshot wounds, because when you bandage the patient, uh, you're creating an anaerobic environment which would help them uh, develop uh, in in those tissues, especially the soft tissues. So, clostridia, soft tissues infections, uh, which is what I would expect we're dealing with in this case, can develop in um, hours or days after the injury has occurred. Um, <clears throat> and uh, because uh, our flora is uh, made of anaerobes, this is why we, we can commonly see them occurring um, in, in, in wound infections or in, in, in soft tissue injuries or traumas or crushing traumas. Um, then we also have aerobic putrid, aerobic gram positive, aerobic gram negative and the peri wound. All of these uh, infections are highly unlikely so that's why I would uh, in this case stick with my answer of um, of anaerobic infection. All right, so moving on. 
Um, so we have, okay, the question here is to make the preliminary diagnosis, okay. So we have a patient, so don't forget the age, the patient is, is 35 years of age, right, okay, cool. And has been suffering from an illness for three days. This is an acute illness. Five days ago, he returned from a trip in Africa. So five days, he was in Africa. And the onset of the disease was covered by fever, so high temperature, chills, acute headache, so chills, acute headache, and myalgia. And then in the axillary region, the lymph node was enlarged up to 3 by 6 and can easily be palpated. So in the axillary region, the lymph node uh, was enlarged to 3 by 6 and can be palpated. The lymph node is dense, intensely painful, and slightly mobile, without any clear margins. And then the skin over the node is hyperemic, so this is a type of hyperemic, and it's tight. And tachycardia is present. Preliminary diagnosis. So in this case, um, I would first of all uh, be thinking of. Uh, <coughs> Of a plague uh, simply on the premise that uh, we have uh, an enlarged a single enlarged uh, a lymph node or in region we have a single enlarged area uh, which is of these dimensions three by six uh, and then the lymph node itself is dense intensely painful um, and without any clear margins which is uh, something that we usually can see in a bubonic plague. So, uh, plague usually um, are caused by Yersinia pestis, and um, these days they're not really that common. These days they're not really that common as as before. When when, uh, when I think uh, I don't remember the time. <laughs> But these days they're not really that common. So symptoms usually are the fever as which the patient has weakness as well as a headache and usually begins um, about a day or up to a week following exposure uh, from from the sick person or following inoculation of, of, the, of the bacteria. And <clears throat> usually... Uh, uh, bubonic plague tends to affect the lymph nodes and then in some cases uh, they might even end up turning uh, becoming black uh, in, 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 in serious cases so you can usually see it so so yeah that's that that'll be how I will be approaching answering this question so with sepsis um, sepsis in this case I wouldn't think about it simply because um, I would need the patient to have a prior or existing uh, illness uh, before I can even conclude that is sepsis that is occurring in the patient. And then in tularemia, if you're looking at crop questions, usually it would be seen in farmers. That's when you can see it. And then uh, lymphadenitis, uh, which is uh, basically uh, inflammation of, of the lymph nodes, um, uh, I, I wouldn't expect it in this case as the patient has a positive travel history um, and symptoms more likely linked to uh, bubonic plague than the lymphadenitis though uh, in terms of presentation symptomatology can be that the patient with lymphadenitis can have enlargement of lymph nodes but not this this large is uh, this is um, larger than usual. All right, uh, moving on. So, okay, so what is the most likely diagnosis? What is the most likely diagnosis? So, a part parturient uh, woman uh, complains of, so is already a woman, she complains of pain uh, of a mammary gland. So, <coughs> She complains of pain of a mammary gland. Um, the area is 
painful and there's infiltration of a three by four and the area is softened uh, in the center. Our body temperature is 38.5. What is the most likely causative? Um, what is the most likely cause in this case? Uh, so the presentation of the patient is that of classic mastitis. Why? Because in mastitis you have inflammation of the breast, part um, huge part meaning that the, the lady has delivered so she's probably um, might be breastfeeding right and in that case uh, we can think of the fact that uh, and um, there's infiltration uh, of three by by four and soft and center so meaning that there could potentially be some pus um, which is why this is separated and the temperature is 88.5. So this is uh, basically um, a simple and straightforward uh, case of mastitis. And um, in terms of looking at the other options, um, if it's pneumonia, pneumonia wouldn't present like this. In pneumonia, what you'd have, pneumonia is a respiratory infection whereby you first of all would of course you can have fever so fever would would also commonly occur in pneumonia but you need to have a productive cough unless you're dealing with atypical pneumonia which can present with other symptoms other than a cough uh, and then on the physical findings there will be more of a uh, respiratory findings uh, such as a downest percussion presence of crackles on auscultation and uh, uh, um uh, as well as other findings. So I definitely rule out pneumonia in this case. And then pleurisy, uh, I would also rule it, out, rule it out because it's also respiratory pathology. We would expect some respiratory symptoms, right? And um, in this case, uh, I would also expect downness to percussion as well as um, a decrease uh, a entry uh, in the in the area that's affected and then with milk retention um, yes you can get enlargement of the breast which can have a softened area but you wouldn't expect to have any uh, changes uh, with temperature or with, with the patient's temperature which you clearly have in this case um, <clears throat> and then uh, birth trauma uh, so no nothing is telling us about the delivery so in this case i can i can simply rule that out all right so moving on to the next question um all right so what is the most likely diagnosis all right so what do we have here so we have um a 52 year old Fifty-two year old man has been suffering from angina for two weeks. So his age is fifty-two, has been suffering from angina for two weeks, and increasingly um he's starting to have frequent pain attacks. So frequent pain attacks in the area behind the sternum and his need for nitroglycerin has increased. Objectively, um, condition is of moderate severity. Skin is pale, probably patient is anemic. Might have anemia of chronic disease in this case because usually angina is a chronic disorder. Uh, <clears throat> heart sounds are weakened, but they're rhythmic though. Uh, heart rate is within the normal range. And then ECG is showing no signs of. Uh, myocardial injury and then our answer in this case is uh, progressive angina pectoris all right so looking at the other answers right and um, just basically um, ruling out the other answers so first time angina pectoris will be out simply because uh, we have been informed by the question that the patient has been suffering from angina pectoris. So that's out. So stable angina, functional class two angina pectoris, uh, would be out in my in my opinion because 
the way this patient is presenting is no longer that of stable angina. And then variant angina pectoris, uh, that is uh, a small to do with, uh, what is this called, uh, nutcracker angina, uh, which, uh, or prince metal angina, yes, prince metal angina, uh, which doesn't present in this case. In prince metal, what we have uh, are sort of like spasms of the coronary artery. So the chest pain, though typical, it will be retrosternal or chest pain that's occurring, uh, would uh, occur spontaneously um, and uh, in this patient who already has a history of angina pectoris, uh, I do not think that we'll be dealing with, with that variant angina pectoris. And then in terms of the treatment as well of variant angina pectoris, uh, we usually uh, recommend giving calcium channel blockers. Uh, in this case, we already know that the patient is having nitroglycerin. Uh, which would help to increase the nitric oxide. So basically, I believe that already that the patient is having angina pectoris. Uh, and then acute cardiac infarction, I'll definitely rule, rule it out because we have an ECG, uh, which is showing you no signs of myocardial infarction. Uh, so if it was acute cardiac infarction uh, or acute myocardial infarction, uh, basically it would have ECG changes. Uh, which can be either an ST segment elevation or uh, an ST segment depression. So basically, when you're when you're thinking of um, cardiovascular diseases related to uh, myocardial infarction and the myocardial infarction or related to coronary artery disease, you need to be aware of uh, acute coronary syndrome. So acute coronary syndrome. Uh, basically has, <clears throat> sorry, it basically has three main pathologies. So we have unstable angina as one of them, which is the given answer in this case, just progressive angina pectoris. And then secondly, we also have a, a acute uh, myocardial infarction with ST segment depression, right? That'll be uh, defined as non-STEMI. Or, and then thirdly, we have, or finally, we have uh, myocardial infarction with ST segment elevation that would be STEMI. So basically those are the three uh, diseases that we have in acute coronary syndrome and of those uh, three the one with the ECG changes of course would be the acute myocardial infarction. So in unstable myocardial, I'm sorry, in unstable angina pectoris or progressive angina pectoris um, you would have first of all worsening symptoms in a patient that you previously know as angina pectoris uh, and uh, the need for treatment basically that's it uh, without any ECG changes that's basically how you would identify this disease clinically and, and both on on the MCQs all right uh, moving on all right so so guys this will be the last question I'll be covering for today's session um, and then I would uh, would meet next time all right so Question is what further treatment tax tactics should we choose? All right, so I, I need to be thinking of treatment. Okay, what treatment tactics? All right, so we have a nine-year-old boy suffering from multiple bronchiectasis since he was three years old. So nine-year-old boy suffering from multiple bronchiectasis since he was three. All right, so exacerbations occur frequently, maybe three to four four times a year. So exacerbations occurring. Uh, maybe three to four times a day. So after conservative therapy, there are short remission periods. Okay, so after conservative therapy, there are short remission periods. All right. the the disease the disease <coughs> progresses the disease progresses, and then the child is physically underdeveloped. So the child is not well developed. So there's underdevelopment of the child. And the child uh, on physical examination is presenting with a pale skin. Probably the child is anemic. Uh, there's acrocyanosis, uh, deformed nail plates, and the shape of a clock face. So they are deformed nail plates, the shape of a clock face. All right. And then bronchography reviews secular bronchiectasis in the lower lobe of the right lung. So there's secular bronchiectasis in the lower lobe. Of the right lung. All right. Okay. So, 
question is again what further treatment tactics should be chosen in, in this case uh, so from the question stem already we can really understand that uh, this is basically not responsive um, bronchiectasis it's not responding to the treatment uh, in this case, uh, so the best way would be to provide um, or to, to do a surgical intervention as um, as the child is not uh, responding to the other conservative treatment. So a continuation of conservative treatment would not be advisable. Physiotherapy um, is is helpful, but, but surgical intervention is this would be the best. And then spa, sanatorium, as well as physical training, um, they are not as best as surgical intervention. So, so I'll still um, stick with my with my answer of uh, surgical intervention. All right. So that was the final question for today. All right. So, all right. So, guys, thank you very much for your attention. Please don't forget to press the subscribe button. Please comment if uh, if you like the videos. I, I would uh, really be waiting for your feedback. Uh, and if you have any videos you want me to make specifically for you guys that would help you understand these topics better, uh, please let me know. Also, if you have any specific topics in general that you want me to explain more and more and more, please, please let me know. So, yeah, I hope to see you next time. Uh, my name is Dr. George Xavier Cause and I'm signing off.